iSelect Fund is not soliciting investment or providing investment advice in any way whatsoever. This presentation is general industry research based on publicly available information. iSelect is an early stage venture capital firm in St. Louis focused on early stage companies in food, agriculture, and health. iSelect invests at the forefront of innovation, seeking emerging problems, solutions, and technologies. iSelect uses these deep dive presentations not only as a way to better engage with and understand new science and technology, but also engage with the experts and entrepreneurs who drive and change innovation in their respective fields. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to iSelect's Deep Dive series. My name is David Yoakum. I'm an associate here on the iSelect Fund Ventures team. I'm excited to wel welcome you to our discussion today. One theme that we've been researching is the future of cheese. Uh, this has been a personal favorite to research. Uh, cheese is an ancient part of human culinary history and certainly one of the world's most beloved foods. However, as consumers have become more environmentally, nutritionally, and ethically conscious in their buying decisions, non-dairy alternatives have emerged uh, that look to match or even challenge this beloved food category. In today's deep dive, we will explore the innovators who are one, uh, building the future of non-dairy cheese and two, improving on its beloved history by offsetting its impacts. So with that, I'd love to start off with some speaker introductions. If we could kick things off with Irina Gary, Kylene Kai Keenan, Richard Clothier and Steve Snyder, that would be fantastic. All right, I guess I'll start. So my name is Irina Gary. I'm currently a chief marketing officer at a food tech startup called Change Foods. I come from a, over a decade of experience in consumer goods, including business strategy at, De at Deloitte, uh, marketing, consumer marketing at Procter & Gamble and Danone, and now on to Change Foods, which is a precision fermentation company, and we'll speak to that more as we go. Thanks, Irina. Kai? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kylene Keenan. I am the founder of Happiest Plant-Based Foods, Happiest Plant Plant-Based Foods. I'm a uh, plant-based chef, holistic nutritionist, and I've been in the consumer product good arena for about 11 years. I started out with superfood raw chocolate in a plant-based cafe on Martha's Vineyard and have evolved to uh, create artisan indulgent plant-based foods. Thanks, Kylene. Richard? Hi, my name is Rich Clothier. I'm the managing director of family business in Somerset in the UK um, called White Farms. Uh, we're a farmhouse family cheese making business that's been making cheese for several hundred years. We're the largest independent cheese maker in the UK and we're the largest independent processor of milk and one of the largest independent producers of renewable energy in the UK, both electricity and gas. And we have recently made my grandmother's Ivy's Vintage Cheddar carbon neutral. And we export cheese to about 160 countries around the world, including to the US. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Rich. And Steve? Hi, I'm Steve Snyder. I'm president and CEO of, uh, of White House Specialties and the founder of the Newfields plant-based cheese division of, of White House Specialties. Had about 30 years of experience in food, nutrition, pharma and, uh, and biotech and a number of different companies and industries and currently leading uh, this privately, a uh, private equity owned company that uh, recently sold to a large Irish uh, firm. And we'll talk more about the, the definition of new fields and, and what we're up to now. Wonderful. Thanks, Steve. Uh, and thank you to all our speakers. Really excited to hear your perspectives today. So just to set the stage for today's conversation, I want to cover three main points. I want to talk about how cheese is made, why we love cheese so much, and then talk through some of the rise of these alternatives and then some challenges that are facing both traditional dairy as well as some of these plant-based alternatives. So to start with traditional cheese, I want to talk about what cheese making really is. And cheese has been a part of human history uh, and human culinary experience for thousands of years and is as old as our relationship with the domestication of milk producing animals. Cheese was likely accidentally discovered, either via the coagulation of proteins from the enzyme rennet, um, which is found in the stomachs of ruminant animals, though there are some alternative theories for how cheese was originally, um, originally discovered. Regardless, cheese has been with us for a long time um, and is now a part of an enormous industry. Now, the main steps of cheese making the cheese making process are shown here. I tread lightly with, uh, with Rich in the room because I know he knows so much about this process. But the main components that I've identified that make cheese so special, we'll talk about that, why those components play a role and why we like cheese so much, is this process of coag the coagulation of proteins, 
which is essentially taking those proteins that are, that are in, that are naturally occurring in milk and contributing fermenting microorganisms and enzymes that cause curdling. There's also a component in the breaking up of those curds as they become solidified that essentially releases the whey protein um, and removes water in the process. And that removal of whey um, and removal of water has a large impact on the softness of the end product and some of the textural components you would expect to see from a cheese in the end. Um, and then finally, the aging process, um, which is also known as affinage, is where a lot of the skill and the knowledge of cheese making is brought to bear. Um, and this is where a lot of the flavor and the complexity of cheese um, can come from. Now, obviously there's more steps in this process and this image on the right is meant to show the numerous steps and complexities that go into cheese making. It's obviously different across different types of cheese, um, but these are some of the main components that sort of give cheese its texture and its flavor um, and its nutritional components that, that we commonly see across this wide variety of cheeses. And this ties a little bit into why we love cheese so much. In the process of cheese making, a product is produced that has some very unique process, properties that are almost unlike any other food product in our, personal, in, our, in our current arsenal of food products. First, cheese has unique flavors. Anything from extremely complex and stinky cheese to the very mild string cheese you might expect to send your kid to school with. And then secondly, and perhaps more importantly, in my opinion, cheese has very unique textural characteristics, typically defined by its stretchability and its meltability. Finally, because of its long-standing history in human civilization and its wonderful properties, cheese plays an important role in cultural dishes around the world. Almost every culture, whether or not there's a large group of people who are lactose intolerant or not, has some sort of cheese component or a, a, like, a liking of cheese that plays a role in some sort of cultural dish, though I do wish that American cheese uh, left more uh, to write home about. So with this in mind, sort of setting the stage that we know how cheese is made, we know that we really like cheese because it has these unique characteristics. The market for cheese is extremely significant and expected to grow to $157 billion globally by 2023 across processed cheese and fresh cheeses. This is, this is really interesting to think about in the context of dairy, give, particularly given that in the US, per capita milk sales have dropped 40% between 1975 and 2018, while cheese sales rose 269%. And so with that, I have a question for Rich. You know, Rich, as someone who's, who's run, who runs a long-standing, significant family business in milk production and cheese production, can you speak a little bit to sort of how White Farms has experienced this rise in demand for cheese while the world has perhaps moved away from general milk, milk cons consumption? Um, certainly in the UK market, they used to serve milk in schools, which was stopped sort of in the 80s and that um, hit consumption of milk products. I think people have, people have got more innovative in the way they use cheese across the board. Cheese is the, the ultimate convenience food, essentially. You can just open the fridge and eat it. But as people have been cooking more in the home, they've been more adventurous in their culinary experiences. They've been using more uh, recipes and um, and we've seen some strong growth in France, for example, where people have been using our vintage, really strong vintage cheddar instead of a parmesan, for example, to flavour dishes. But the cheddar gives it something texturally that you don't get from parmesan. So there's a whole host of ways. I and mean, when I first started getting involved in selling cheese, people were fairly one dimensional in the UK about how they enjoyed it. It was sort of cheese sandwich, cheese on toast. Whereas now cheese can be the centerpiece of any meal and, you know, whether it's breakfast or lunch or dinner, you know, so um, it's proved its versatility in a number of recipes and actually we're seeing people really enjoying strong vintage cheddar in the Asian markets, modifying dishes they would enjoy and adding cheddar to. I don't think there's anything you can add cheddar to that it doesn't improve, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think and I, I think it speaks a little bit to anybody who's gone through the retail experience of buying milk versus buying cheese. Um, cheese still very Milk, milk has very much been mixed in with a lot of the other plant-based alternatives that are out and available today. If you're shopping for milk, it's very much in your face that the, the opportunity to buy an alternative and so many different kinds of alternatives. However, you go to a store, most commonly cheese in and of itself is it's still in its own category. And the plant-based cheese is oftentimes sort of in a different section that's catered more towards vegans. And so you can see how there's been sort of been this lag between the transition toward, toward 
traditional dairy to plant-based dairy versus into cheese where cheese really still has this sort of hold as its own category. So while we love cheese, cheese is not without its flaws, which typically fall into the categories of environmental impacts, animal welfare, and in some cases, human health impacts. The, the last point is more in, up for debate, in my opinion. It really depends on a person-to-person -person basis, the type of product you're serving and, and how it's produced. Um, but the environmental impacts of cheese are significant and, and should be addressed. Now, we'll cover these more in more depth in the next slide. But because of some of these impacts and, and this consumer awareness around some of these challenges around cheese and around the food system in general, in the last five, 10 years in particular, uh, non-dairy alternatives for cheese have emerged to challenge the world of traditional cheese um, with products that are suitable uh, for lactose intolerant and vegan consumers. Today, there are over 130 companies that are working on non-dairy cheese alternatives across large companies through startups, um, probably more than, this is this from an article I read earlier this year, there might be closer to, closer to 200 now. And 10% of cheese launches in 2020 were non-dairy alternatives, which is a significant uptick from what you would have expected to see a decade ago. Now, the approaches to, to non-dairy cheese fall into these sort of three broad categories here. And, and there is nuance between them that I haven't, I haven't attempted to capture here. So I don't want to oversimplify plant-based cheese production, but I just want to give people a scope who may be new to this on sort of the different ways in which this might be done. Now, the basic premises are one, to use traditional food science, low cost ingredients like plant oils, gels, gums, starches, from sort of more of a components perspective to make these types of cheese products. The second is to, to apply more traditional cheese making practices, like we discussed earlier, to simply to plant-based milks, or to do so in a larger fermentation capacity. So either in sort of an artisan capacity and sort of more of a larger fermentation capacity. And then there's a, there's a fourth principle, and, uh, and we'll have Arena touch on this um, in her section today, um, but this opportunity to use synthetic biology and, and precision fermentation to essentially create organisms that can produce the components of cheese that really matter. Most commonly, it's casein protein. And we'll talk a little bit about, about why that is. Now, to speak a little bit on the plant-based side, Kylene, I have, a, I have a question for you. So, you know, plant-based cheese isn't a totally new innovation in the grand scheme of things. And in fact, you and I spent a good amount of time talking about how many good plant-based products there are gen generally for quite some time. However, the plant-based category has grown substantially in the last in the last five to 10 years in particular, uh, and the product quality has come a long way too. Why, why do you think that is, and why has there been such a surge in this category? And what do you think the greatest driver is for people striving to find a really delicious plant-based cheese uh, that might have been a traditional turnoff for traditional cheese eaters? Absolutely. So, you know, I think the demand has increased, obviously, for the reasons that you mentioned, you know, in environmental um, health. And, you know, I feel like everybody loves cheese because of the depth of flavor. And I think with the ones that were on the market five or 10 years ago, it kind of really lacked that that depth of flavor. So I think foodies alike, you know, we've been we've been seeking artisan techniques made out of real quality ingredients, just like, you know, not unlike how the cheese industry, you know, unfolded. I mean, like you said, it's it's one of the oldest industries in the world of, of modern food and no one dairy process is alike because every single culture has a different milk, has a different fermentation process. And I think the same is for, you know, is for plant-based cheese is now we're starting to, you know, grow rinds and things like that. And, and um, I think that we're looking to replace that um, in our diet as, as a standalone food, like Rich was saying. I mean, you can go into the open the door in the fridge and, and cut a piece of cheese and you've got high, you know, high protein, high fat and, and an interesting flavor. And I think that, you know, all of us that are leaning more towards plant-based are, are looking for that depth of flavor. No, thanks, Kai. Yeah. Steve, I want to bring your perspective to bear here because you have a unique experience across plant-based cheese products that basically anything shown here, you've had pretty much some exposure to. Can you talk a little bit about how the technology suite for plant-based cheese production and development has improved and, and sort of how we've come up, how, how many varieties there really are now um, with improving levels of functionality? Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think for all the reasons that you've mentioned already, and you know, Kylie mentioned that 
you know, consumers and, you know, advocates of, of the cheese broadly are looking for alternatives and they need a way to make them in quantity and, um, and make them in ways that are sustainable and, and yield a product that they're, you know, that they want to go eat. So I think, um, you know, the, the, the challenge from a technology standpoint is staying broad enough so that you can accommodate all of the innovation that's occurring. So, you know, I, I think, um, all the panelists here and, and, you know, sort of in the world of plant-based cheese, you're going to continue to see innovation and whether it's in you know, the categories you, you've shown here or, you know, other ways that you might slice and dice the, um, you know, the potential uh, realm of innovation. The key is, you know, can you take those, those innovations, put them into a, a, a modern manufacturing uh, uh, scenario and, you know, produce a consumer product that, uh, you know, can find a place on the shelves. And this, this includes, you know, shelf life considerations. It, it considers um, convenient packaging, Ziploc bags, and so forth, attractive packaging, all the things that um, you're seeing the winning brands doing. And so from where we sit at Newfields, it's really about, you know, how do we provide that muscle behind these uh, innovative purpose uh, driven brands so that, um, you know, all this innovation can continue. I don't think anyone even on this call would say that, you know, we're there yet. And so, um, you know, the question is, how do you, you know, how do you stay flexible and how do you adopt and stay nimble to uh, accommodate all the innovation? Thanks, Steve. Arena, I, I thought I thought I saw you unmute there for a second. I don't know if you wanted to add something because I know you have. Yeah, I, I would I just, I think a <laughs> couple of thoughts. So I did work on, on plant-based cheese for some time, actually, while at right. Deno and I worked on so delicious uh, cheese. So very familiar with, with plant-based category, as well as I worked on Silk, which is a leading brand of plant-based milks. And I would say the biggest difference you see is, you know, plant-based milks have reached 40% household penetration and cheese is, is kind of stuck in low single digits. And yes, it has grown and, you know, 2020 grew 42%. Um, and, and that's largely driven by much better option. Kind of what Kylie mentioned, you know, we were used to be stuck with, with a really kind of old and not really acceptable analog. And it's come a long way. Players like Violife have really taken, you know, the market by the storm and, and grown triple digits um, over the last couple of years. That's driven largely by improved performance. We have made strides in kind of how we combine the fats and the starches in plant-based cheese, where now you can have a fairly decent kind of cold slice of, you know, cheese in a, in a case. And artisan cheeses have also come a long way. If you look at players like Miyoko's with fermented cheeses, you can have a pretty great cream cheese or a cheese wheel that delivers on consumer expectations. Where we see the big gap right now and the reason what's you know kind of holding plant-based cheese as a category is the melty, stretchy, warm application, be it in a pizza or in a sauce or a lasagna. And what we see is a lot of consumers' expectations are not met. And what we're hearing from them is that they say, look, I totally go vegan, right? And, and I've gone there with milk. I just can't do it with cheese. And, and that performance is what's drive is holding it back. So lots, lots of progress, not there yet, as, as Steve said. And I think that's, you know, kind of serving this up is fermentation is an entirely different solution in my mind, because it is not a non-dairy product. We are making dairy components, right? We're fermenting casein molecules that are identical to what you get from a cow just made without a cow. So when I think of that technology coming to market and it's not in market quite yet, but when I think of it, in my mind, it's really creating a new category of cheese. And you know, in the industry, we're, we're calling it animal free rather than non-dairy uh, to draw a distinction in what the product is, which is right. actual dairy versus you just made without the animal. That's a, yeah, I think there's, there's one point you made there that just talks about the way people just aren't willing to compromise. Cause I think that poses a challenge for alternatives, but it also really speaks to the opportunity. I mean, there's very, there's very few product categories where you can be so sure that if you got it right, that people would buy it and want to have it. I mean, cause it's just, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. And maybe this is a, this is a good time to actually transition to some of the, some of the challenges between dairy and plant-based that I just want to highlight is that it, it, and I, I, I don't, I'm kind of surprised that I didn't know this before, but we, we had, we had been speaking with a company that was working on precision fermentation in this space. And they were talking through some of the stats of how many people are lactose intolerant in the world. And it's, it's like almost everybody. I mean, it's, it's like 65% of people 
um, and, and a large portion of those um, living in Asia and Africa, but also you know globally, do not have either the enzymes or the or the microbiome to be able to consume lactose in a in a uh, compelling way. Now, I will say, after having read through it, cheese does have a lot less lactose than what you would expect to see from a, from milk or from um, from yogurt. So it's not it's not always as big of an issue. And lactose intolerance has very different levels of of uh, um, severity across people, but it's it's a big group of people across the world where their consumption of this product that most of the world really, really loves is totally limited. So clearly a, a big, big opportunity, a big white space there for a product that is performs and delivers nutritionally in a way that matters. I want to cover a few points on some of the challenges that I think all of the speakers here today are going to be able to speak to um, in a really compelling way. So um, dairy cheese, uh, I want to highlight some of the, the environmental footprint data because I think it is compelling. Um, cheese on average, top five GHG emitter across all food products per kilogram, top three land user and number one in water consumption for uh, across all food products. So it's really, it really sits, only ever sits really behind red meat in terms of, in terms of impacts from a land consumption, water consumption, and GHG emission perspective. And though it varies significantly, and, and I know Rich can speak to this, uh, across different types of operations. The industrial nature of milk production is something that consumers are becoming more aware of, as we talked about previously. And we've already covered the lactose intolerance piece here. On the plant-based side, Arena alluded to this, and I would encourage any listeners here who haven't tried plant-based cheeses, every time you go to the store, just like, just like buy a new one and just like see like what the experience is like, because what you're going to find is that the experience is extremely variable, which is exciting because you just never really know what you're going to get. But I've in the last six weeks tried some plant-based cheeses where I was like, wow, I would 100% serve that at a dinner party and nobody would know the difference. And I've had some experiences like I would never serve that at a dinner party because uh, everyone would want to go home. And so I think there's just a, there's a huge breadth of, of quality right now that hasn't settled out largely due to the points that, that Arena made around, around flavor, function, texture, and meltability. And then finally, I think the one thing, one point we haven't covered yet today is around price. Prices is, is important. And I think there's an important point to be made here because, because plant-based cheese is still catching up to functionality of, um, of dairy-based cheese. And then precision fermentation approaches haven't quite scaled to the point where they're producing at a cost competitive point. Um, the value prop for the general broad consumer is a pretty tough value prop. Because if you're getting a product that you perceive to be less functional and also more expensive, um, that's a big, that's a, that's a, that's a tough hurdle for most consumers to want to get, to get over, especially if cheese is one of the few products that they're, they're unwilling to compromise on. So for the plant-based alternatives, there's a, there's a hurdle they have to get over with the quality piece, obviously first, which we saw in the, you know, the, in the same thing with the impossible foods and the beyond meats and, and the end of the V2s of those products. Um, and we're also going to see plant-based cheese and, and alternative cheeses need to get, need to get over that. Arena, I, 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 have, I do have one, one more question for you. And I, I has, well, I hesitate to ask it now because I, I, I want to touch on it more in your specific section. But I think, you know, you and I talked a little about the importance of scale for non-dairy cheeses to have a big impact. I mean, there's a difference between an artisan cheese, which does have an impact and is an important part of this story, and like buying like a massive bag of mozzarella that you use to make pizzas. I mean, there's just a huge difference in the amount of cheese that can be made at that functionality where at a low price. And how does, how does precision fermentation sort of bridge, potentially bridge that gap between this opportunity for quality and scale to sort of, sort of come together? Yeah, I mean, as you, as you started, right, cheese is a massive global industry. It's you know, $150 billion today. And the environment at impact is absolutely astounding, right? Like if we're looking at second to red meat, it's, it's a lot of environmental impact. And the reason for that is as problematic as dairy production is, it takes about you know, 10 liters of milk to one kilo of cheese. So you're essentially amplifying the animal farming and industrial agriculture impact of dairy by 10 and cheese consumption continues to grow. So what it does is creates this issue where maybe the dairy consumption globally is, is reducing liquid, liquid milk consumption is going down. Cheese is more than making up for the Delta. And so overall animal agriculture continues to increase. And I think that's, that's a big issue. And it, it speaks to scale of kind of the problem that we have on our hands in terms of people love cheese. They want to continue to consume it. 
And yet we have bursted out of our planetary boundaries in terms of how many animals can be farmed um, sustainably. And so when we look at new technologies, plant-based cheese is limited you know, by definition, given its structural and physical properties of, of the plant-based ingredients that you have, precision fermentation does offer that interesting solution because it does have the same chemical properties of the molecules. Scale is the issue, right? And, and you've hit the nail on the head is how do we get precision fermentation to scale? And I would say that it's not dissimilar to any other kind of revolutionary process where right now we're early stages. It is, you know, intensive, it is um, expensive. The yields are not where we need them to be in order to be commercially viable. But the objective is absolutely to get to those large commercial scale, you know, fermenters of 300,000 liters and up in order to produce those compounds because that, that literally would be the only way that, you know, we at least at Change Foods achieve our objective of delivering an environmentally sustainable product at scale. Yep, yep, that's a really, really great point. We'll come back to some of that and some of the some of the key components about what you guys are making and why they matter. Um, David, can I can I add just one quick point? And so, Steve, please. Of what Irina was saying, I just wanted to sort of mention for the audience that there are uh, uh, there's a history here of successful scaling of um, you know, recombinant technology or synthetic biology across pharmaceutical, food ingredients, et cetera. You know, I've personally been involved in a number of those um, various ingredients that are, that are made at that 40,000 liter and up scale. So I'm, I'm very bullish on this as a, as a future uh, outcome. And so um, I just want to give credibility behind what Arena and the team is doing because that, that really is the future. And there is, um, you know, there is a track record of that, of that being viable. So it's not just a, a pipe dream. Very good. Yeah, actually, more, more, more importantly, even what Steve mentioned is recombinant or fermentation, precision fermentation technology exists in cheese today, right? At, that 90% of cheese worldwide is made with non-animal rennet, which is produced through precision fermentation. So in some ways, it is evolutionary technology where we've taken the calf out of cheese, so to speak, where we no longer need to slaughter calves to get rennet. And now we're taking the cow out of cheese. But it is no more um, kind of novel and, and different than what is in our food supply today already at incredible scale. Yeah, very, very good point. Um, well, this, this is a good transition point. So we're gonna, we're gonna jump into highlighting a few of our speakers here. Um, one of the things I love about working in uh, food system innovation is just the, role, the different roles that are relevant to this story. Uh, and I'm really excited to have Rich touch on the story of White Farms um, and some of the really interesting work that they're doing that sort of paints a compelling story around the, the role in which farming can be a part of this solution. Um, and I think they're doing some really, really innovating work. So um, Rich, first of you could just, maybe just a little refresher on the background of White Farms, the history of the business, and then and then touch on, touch on the, the story with the carbon neutral cheese. Tell us what that actually means and sort of how you made the decision to take your company in that direction, because that's that's not a small feat to want to roll out to a network of 150 farms. Yes, yeah, so um, <clears throat> as I explained before, we've been making cheese for hundreds of years. My grandparents used to say, if you look after nature, nature will look after you. And um, we've experimented with whole, we, we've tried to make cheese of all sorts of analogs, you know, we've made soya cheeses, we've made veggie oil cheeses, and until you get the milk right, it's very difficult to make a really good cheese, you know, you've, it's only ever going to be as good as the milk, so I'm quite excited about trying some of the um, precision fermented milk when it's, you know, when it's made, because I think I could make a decent cheese, if the milk's <laughs> good, I could make a fantastic cheese out of it. The, um, in terms of the environmental impact, I'm a passionate but my family still farm, although I'm a cheese maker and we run a food business, my family still farm. We, still, we have got our own dairy farms. We've got um, about 150 farms that supply us in the region. Um, I'm passionate about uh, farming and cheese making. And I know that if we're going to be making cheese in another 100 years time, we have to do it in a way that has a minimal impact on the environment. And I get slightly frustrated when I see the progress that's being made in other areas of industry. Um, you know, we, as far as I'm concerned, in, in industry, we have to be practical environmentalists. 
we have to make the things that we want to make, but we have to make them in a way that's not going to knacker the environment and ruin the planet. And, um, you know, in the same way that it was never practical, probably, to say to everyone, ditch your cars and go and ride a bicycle every day when you travel to London, you know, three hours away. Um, it, it's not practical. People have um, developed uh, transport systems that are kind to the environment and, and making huge progress. Um, and, and I would argue we haven't made enough progress in agriculture, you know, a lot of progress in the UK has been made in transport, energy generation, we've done a load of work ourselves, but actually in the farming systems, we've only really scratched the surface. And so one, so the things that I've been doing in my business is to challenge ourselves at every single thing that we do in every part of the chain to do it in a way that's um, as environmentally responsible as possible, but then if it isn't, start to look at other ways of doing it. And, you know, we've done, we've made a huge amount of progress without getting into any, you know, just through good management things, we've made a huge amount of progress, but we've also adopted some really good technologies and, and science, and we're looking at some really good innovations in feeding on farms of enzymes that help reduce methane emissions from cows and those sorts of things. Um, but I think the thing that surprised me the most when we first really started digging into this project, the difference in emissions between different farmers. And if you if you take, for example, our lowest farmer that supplies us was running at about half a kilo of CO2 equivalent per litre of milk, and then the highest is sort of over three kilos, you know? So there's a massive range of production. So so much more we found that we could do by just working closer with farmers. And, and, and we've done a load of other work with soil sampling, um, uh, increasing organic matter within the soil, sequestering more carbon and those sorts of things. So I'm actually really excited about the potential within farming to change and actually adapt and save the world. Because although cheese sales might be growing quite strongly in the global market, actually, if there's a potential to reduce our, collectively to reduce our emissions by 80%, um, it's really quite exciting, but what, what I find really unexciting is our, our politicians' attitude put to this, in, in, particularly in the UK. You know, there's no, there's no real interest from government at the moment in actually reducing the impact of farming. You know, people talk a lot about alternatives to meat products and cheese products, but in my experience of trying to change consumer behaviour, it can be pretty difficult. And the practical environmentalist in me says that we have to farm and make these things in a way that is going to, you know, taste exactly the same, but not do damage to the environment. And that's what the whole project's been about. And so we've got this low carbon group of farmers that we're using to make this cheese, which we've named after my grandmother, Ivy, who's passionate about the countryside and the environment. And, and that's the first carbon neutral cheddar to be launched in the UK market. So I'm really pleased about that. The, in, 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 terms of, in terms of how you've rolled this out with some of your farmers, can you just give everybody a little bit of the, I think one of the things that's great about what you're doing is there's, you've, you've deployed a lot of technology in a lot of different ways that I, think, that I think a lot of traditional farming would view as high risk in terms of initial adoption um, and like really deploying these. Can you just briefly give us some some scope of like the types of tech that's being deployed on farms that you're working that that, you, that are in your network to help essentially reduce that that carbon that carbon footprint because it's a lot of different ways that you guys are doing that. Yeah, we do. I mean, the, the best thing we can do is manage the farming businesses as efficiently as possible because you know a cow is producing methane. Um, so there's a lot we can do with the feeding. There's a lot of innovations on the feeding. There's some really interesting um, enzymes, etc., coming through. Um, we do a load of stuff with renewables. So you know, solar on farm roofs, um, collecting the manure and the farm waste, and putting it all through anaerobic digestion for um, generating methane, and um, which is then cleaned up and goes back into the grid. Um, we work collaboratively with farmers on 
um, on land management and growing, tree and hedge planting, taking out the marginal land. It tends, well, what my, my experience of dairy farming has been that the, um, it tends to be the marginal land and the marginal animals that actually drive the environment, a lot of the environmental emissions. So if they've got areas of the farm that are shaded or poorly drained or whatever, quite often they're better off set aside. Yeah. They become the high input areas where they get poorer outputs. So those all those sort of marginal things on the farm can be farmed in different ways and, and help to lower the emissions and and actually encourage biodiversity because dairy farms quite often get, get accused of being deserts of biodiversity. And what we've tried to do is create farms with pockets of biodiversity all around the productive areas. So um, we're encouraging farmers to have much, much wider hedgerows and, um, and areas of the farm. So we've got um, so we've got the so so the nature is integrated within the productive areas of the farm. So you've got highly efficient dairy farms, but at the same time you've got um, really really strong biodiversity as well, which I always find really interesting. Helps to control insects and pests and other things as well. Wonderful. Well, um, Rich, thank you for giving us some insight into some of the really important work that Mike's doing in terms of uh, in terms of bringing together the world of she's making delicious products um, and also responding to some of the environmental climate challenges posed by the, by the dairy industry. At the end, um, I think that most, most of the audience will want to know where they can get, where they can find um, Ivy's reserve. So we can, we can touch on that at the, uh, at the end when we wrap, when we wrap things up here. Um, next, I want to talk about one of our um, innovators in plant-based uh, cheese, um, Kylene Keenan. Um, uh, Kylene, the work you're doing at Happiest, really exciting um and the product looks awesome i don't know if anybody can see the picture on the bottom uh but if you were to again serve that at a party i was at i wouldn't bat an eye it looks like a great looking cheese um can you tell us a little bit about the story of founding happiest and and just give us a sense of really what is artisan cheese making how does it work where is it similar to traditional cheese making and perhaps where is it different Absolutely. So the story of Happiest uh, actually began 11 years ago when I started a company called Not Your Sugar Mamas on the island of Martha's Vineyard. It's an organic raw chocolate company. And um, I actually transitioned that company into Happiest. So we make plant-based cheese and we make superfood raw chocolate. Um, and it really started, you know, I was just out of college and I was living abroad and I came back and I wanted to be part of a, something that that made an impact on the environment. Um, I've always been, you know, I've always been a proponent of healing our environment and seeing kind of like the time running out to really make change in that. And um, so I started in, you know, I, I met my business partner, she was making raw chocolate, got into the plant, you know, got into the chocolate category, eventually opened up a plant-based cafe where we made chocolate. Um, and so I had these artisan dips and cheeses, again, using all whole foods, nuts, seeds, um, everything organic, plant-based and gluten-free. And uh, the cheese evolved because I was making simple cheeses. So like blends of almond, uh, blanched almonds and lemon juice and olive oil and salt. And that was my almond ricotta. And then I had cashew cheese sauces and, you know, things that you can make at home. You just blend it up. And I was making, I had a uh, organic flatbread paleo vegan flatbread truck. And so we, we served that. But then I went to, to Rome, actually, I teach a retreat there. And I found somebody who was using, you know, traditional cheese making practices to make these artisan cheeses. And <clears throat> at the time, there wasn't really anything like it on the market. Everything, you know, here in the US at that time had been, you know, with the thickening agents and the oils and the starches, which are great for, you know, a replacement and to kind of give the texture of cheese, but I think really lack the depth of flavor that, you know, real foodies are, are looking. For. So I started playing around with the, you know, making the, this cheese at home. And eventually um, I started with a, with a Roquefort actually, which actually takes longer to age. And um, I, cause I love blue cheese. I love like the, the depth. I love stinky cheeses. And so when I went vegan and plant-based, I really couldn't find anything that, that mimicked that. So long story short, I started making these on a small scale. There was a, a friend of mine. She 
she's been in the artisan um, cheese industry for quite some time, and she had worked at a local farm on Martha's Vineyard um, making their cheeses, and I asked her to help me with this vegan cheese, and ironically, she couldn't eat dairy at the time because Ed was <laughs> making her so sick, so she was like, sure, I'll do it, and at first, you know, she was always kind of a, a little bit against the idea um, of vegan because obviously dairy was her category. So um, she kind of helped me scale this. And so we now are at a point where we just outgrew those cheese caves and we're building out cheese caves um, and a whole production facility here in Rhode Island. Um, because like many of you have said, it's, it's, it's not an easy product to co-pack. Manufacturing is not set up. We have had to figure it all out. You know, I use meat grinding machines to make my vegan <laughs> dairy cheese and um and so the second part of that question was just the, um, just uh, helping helping the audience just understand the nuances between a traditional cheese making process and uh um yeah. and an artisan plant-based cheese making process because there's some similarities in terms of yeah. how you go about this and kind of the beauty of that process but obviously some differences in that is it just the materials that are different the starting materials or are there some other components in terms of processing, flavoring, aging, those yeah. different. Absolutely. So there's a lot of similarities. I think that the biggest difference, so like artisan plant-based cheese versus obviously like one with starches and that's a completely different product totally. process. But the artisan plant-based cheese is the one, you know, that you're typically seeing with a cheddar or a, 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 a brie or things like that in the dairy industry. Well, they start with a liquid phase, right? So they, they have the, they have the, um, the milk, whatever, whatever milk it is. Um, I've made the artisan plant-based cheese a couple different ways. I mean, essentially nut milk is just nuts and water. So we don't necessarily have to like make nut milk and then make cheese. We can just use less water to get a thicker consistency. So I think that from what I've heard, I've never made traditional cheese, but from what I've heard, the big difference is the liquid phase versus you don't, you can make it with a liquid phase, but you can also just make it by grinding, you know, nuts or, or blending to get the consistency that you're looking for. Yeah. Um, I think fermentation times are a little bit different. Aging is a little bit different. Um, what we wrap it in. So this is like kind of, I, you know, we wrap it in tr traditional cheese paper, finding the cheese paper that's appropriate for artisan plant-based cheese is quite different because, you know, some, they've been created for, for dairy cheeses. And so ours have some different issues. Like, you know, ours could become oily and there's a cheese for that, but then it doesn't have the breathability of this one for a white mold. So kind of reinventing the wheel with how we package. And then, um, so, so that's a little bit different, but other than that, I mean, we use, we use penicillin candidum, we use microbes, we use, you know, fermentation and artisan techniques to, to really achieve the same, a similar quality. And I think the big difference, like we've all been saying is it's not exactly the same in the way that it's going to get that stretchiness. Um, again, that's not so like our philosophy at Happiest is to use really nutrient dense whole ingredients. So I wouldn't put anything synthetic in the cheese to, to make it that way. If I can find a plant-based way to do that in something out of nature, I would. Um, but in the meantime, I think um, it's, it's different in the gooey meltiness. Yeah. Um, but flavor, I think, is uh, pretty comparable. Well, maybe that's, that's a, so I want to ask you a question. I also want Steve to comment on the same question. Um, and I think it's, it's going to relate, it's going to relate to some of what Arena is going to talk about and just some of the, that the importance of, you know, work that will happen probably in the next 10 years of, of doing plant-based products or alternative products in this category. So I think one of the largest criticisms I've heard of plant-based cheeses is that their functionality is just limited. Like you mentioned the flavors there and the, the functionality is limited. But I think one of the things that we talk a lot about internally is how much is it limited? I mean, really where, where is the ceiling and how close can it really get? Cause I've heard some claims that, you know, plant-based cheese will really never get super close to, uh, to dairy based cheeses. And then I see an article about innovations that Nobel foods has made or others where they've, they've in, you know, deploying prolamin technology to essentially get better melty, better, better cheese type of performance. Kai and then Steve, can you give us some perspective on really where you see the ceiling for, for plant-based cheese products? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think, I think that's a hard, it's a hard question to answer because 
I think that, you know, we can achieve certain things through technology, but I also think that there's, there's a philosophy of food that's so whole that it's like, you know, if we're using technology, then we're kind of just creating in some aspects, you know, something more processed. And so there's, I think the school of thought with cheese, it's, it's so artisan and it's so, um, I mean, ancient in that way that it's, it's not necessarily using technology, but, but technique and, and high quality ingredients to get there. Um, so I think that it will, I think that there'll be, it'll segment in two ways. Yeah. One is that it, it'll go more technology based and, you know, you'll have those innovations like the Daya foods and, you know, the veal lifes and stuff like that. And then I think it will go in the way of like the Miyoko's and, you know, the happiest and yeah. um, that kind of direction where it'll be maybe more whole food ingredients and it, and we'll just have to get used to a little bit of those nuances. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it, it will go in two ways, just, not not dissimilar to the dairy industry itself where it's the processed cheese and then it's kind of more of those natural organic artisan cheeses sure. yeah uh steve do you have any any quick thoughts there yeah i was gonna say so much to say in so little time um, <laughs> you got to think about uh, the world of cheese i mean it's really i think when you start at that range and you say well look i you know i think rich's comments were dead on i mean we've been making this for hundreds and hundreds of years the world of cheese is so broad that you have to answer, you know, Kylene's question um, in, in segments. So, for instance, if we look at hard cheese, if we look at a parm or a feta, I would say, you know, we're going to get really darn close, even with starch and oil technology today, to have something that, you know, you would, you would look at and say, boy, this is, this is very similar. If you look at uh, very high-end artisan cheese like, like Kylene is making, Boy, I mean, that, that's going to be very hard in many cases. It may be impossible to get there. Um, and so when, when, we, when we sort of think about the future of cheese, um, those hard cheeses that, that, that can be done, you know, I think that, that innovation is occurring. Um, when you go to mozzarella, you look at plant uh, at pizza cheese and so forth, and some things that, you know, Irina is talking about, um, you know, you're going to need to think about just from a, from a chemistry and biochemistry standpoint, what the, the amazing protein that casein really is. I mean, this was put on the planet, Kylene, just through nature and it, it evolved, you know, for a reason. And so, um, gosh, to say that we're gonna just throw, throw some starch at something and have it be as stretchy and chewy and, and have the same mouthfeel as casein is gonna be tough. So yeah. some of the innovations might be very relevant and absolutely critical for for those types of, of cheeses. So, you know, what we've done, um, you know, what we're trying to do here from a manufacturing standpoint is innovate across all those different cheese types, knowing that I think, and Kylie mentioned, that taste is something that we can get to. It's just that the meltability, mouthfeel, and, yep. and texture is, is a challenge. The one other thing I'll bring up, and we haven't talked about it, but I know we're short on time, is nutrition. And I, I, I have to say that um, as a community, we, we have to think about how to get plant-based cheese um, similar on the nutrition profile. And I know, I know Irina by her background is going to be thinking about this. Um, consumers today are pretty okay with whether it be because of lactose intolerance or, or other factors, sustainability, et cetera, they're willing to accept maybe less than, than great on nutrition. But if you look at natural cheese, you're talking 23 to 24%. And you know, Rich, you're, you're making that just automatically, that, that's how cheese kind of comes out from a protein profile. Today's plant-based cheeses, many of them are very low on protein. And you know, I think one of the, the big wishes I would have for innovation and, and manufacturing is how do we get the protein, not just for functionality, not just stretch, but just so that you could give your kid uh, a plant-based stick of cheese and feel good about it. I'm not handing, I'm, I'm not handing my daughter or son uh, you know, a starch and oily um, something that tastes good, they can stuff in their mouths, but I'm actually handing them something that, that helps them nutritionally. So, gosh, I mean, I'll stop there, but there's a, there's a ton to say across all of it. Well, I think, I think, I think you summarized it exceptionally well. I think those are all the really, really important points. I think it helps give some perspective and also is, is highly relevant to what Irina is working on. So I really appreciate the, the helpful transition. Irina, I think, so I, I want you to talk a little bit about just the 
So what you guys are making at Change Foods and why casein matters and why these other components matter. So not, it's not just, casein obviously is an incredibly core mm-hmm. component to the production of cheese, but those are these other components you guys are looking at. Um, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that, particularly in the context of having been at Danone and making this change to go to Change Foods, making this change to go to Change Foods. Um, <laughs> like, like there's a reason why you saw an opportunity there. And so I realize it's not a totally coherent question. Can you tie those pieces together for us to understand? Sure why this is so, why this key component is so important and why maybe that ties into your story. Yeah. Well, I think just piggybacking up what Steve said, there will be multiple components to the cheese story, right? There's room for the artisan sustainable cheese makers from, from dairy cars. There, there's room for artisan cashew based, amazing wheels that, that Kailin is doing. But if you look at the consumption globally in, in the US, the two biggest categories of cheese are mozzarella and cheddar. That's where the majority of, of consumption sits. And so for, for me working on plant-based cheese, that's the most rate limiting step is you need casein. Casein is an amazing molecule um, that has certain functionality. And obviously that's the protein content of cheese that we're talking about, because as, as Rich mentioned, when you coagulate milk, um, whey falls out and water falls out, right? So that's your 90% waste factor. And then you're left with casein and, and fats. So having worked on plant-based cheese and seeing the limitation and obviously seeing the, that being as a limiting factor to broad scale adoption is you need to get cheese that tastes, smells, stretches, and has good nutrition. Um, and because I'm the same way, you know, I, sustainably minded as I am, nutrition matters, right? Composition and quality of ingredients matters. And seeing that was kind of the impetus to say, well, what's next, right? What other solutions can we bring to, to the table? And precision fermentation technology is incredibly promising because, again, we are making the exact same KC molecule that you get from a cow at 90 plus rates of efficiency in terms of water consumption, greenhouse gas emissions, um, feedstock inputs, et cetera. And and the promise to deliver on that consumer experience is tremendous, right? Both from functionality and nutrition. It will take us a little bit of time, right? We're we're early stage. So think of where, um, you know, some of, you know, Rennet casein, or sorry, Rennet um, came about about 30 years ago and it was scaled through mostly, I think of it as a farmer grade technology, similar to how we make vaccines and other ingredients in food. What we need to do now is take some of these principles but flip them into what I call food manufacturing technology, which has very different um, operating principles, uh, parameters and cost structure. And so what we at Change are doing is looking to really take this technology, right? There's, there's a IP component, a biotech component of how you get microorganisms to produce casein. But then the second step very immediately is scaling that within food grade environment and then making cheese and manufacturing cheese. And this is where, again, thinking of ourselves not as a ingredient company or a biotech company, but thinking of ourselves as a food manufacturing company and structuring it as such is absolutely critical because at the end of the day, we don't make much of a difference in the world unless we are shipping you know, pallets and pallets of mozzarella and cheddar that is sold in, in retail environment and put on Pizza Hut pizza um, <laughs> at the cost that consumers are willing to accept. There is still some work to be done. I, you know, we're early stage. So there's work to be done both in kind of progressing the biotech and increasing our yields and making sure we get the right, you know, grams per pound of or per liter of fermentation. But then there's also just pure scale of production and manufacturing and line efficiency and distribution um, that enables proper pricing at shelf. Um, and, you know, we have a glide path. There was a question in Q&A. We certainly have a glide path in terms of getting there. It's based on a number of assumptions and thresholds and and benchmarks we have to hit. Um, But the idea is in the next five to 10 years is that this technology will be not only commercially viable, but competitive. And when we look at projections for specifically protein production to be even potentially below cost of dairy, again, because you're spending 
a lot of the cost of dairy cheese manufacturing is raising the cow, feeding the cow, and then taking 90% of your product and chucking it out the door as you, as you coagulate it into cheese. So it's highly inefficient process. And by focusing downstream and creating just the molecules we need, we're able to save a lot um, on all of these processes. The second point I'll make is, as you, as you mentioned, David, protein is one component right. of cheese. There are also other things in it and, and fats is being the main component and lipids and particularly the aromatic components of cheese are absolutely critical. What differentiates the aroma and the mouthfeel of a cheddar from a Parmesan is driven by both the, the lipids as well as the cultures you use to ferment. So a, kind of a second pillar of our technology development is the fermentation, kind of the secondary step of fermentation and creating those microbial lipids that come with the aromatic profile of traditional cheese, uh, which we believe is again, uh, kind of further downstream because now we're talking product rather than ingredient, but in order to deliver the product that delivers on consumer expectations, fats are absolutely critical to this. Excellent. Well, uh, Irina, thank you for summarizing. I think a lot of the really key points here around why you guys are focusing on what you're focusing on, how much work there has yet to be done, but also the fact that you're targeting where potentially by a, you know, by a, by a volume perspective, you could have a really, really significant impact um, on the industry. Um, seeing where we are from a time perspective, I do want to make sure we have a chance to get to at least one or two questions from the audience. Um, the first, the first that I'd like to ask um, is, uh, I'm curious to hear people's perspectives on the feasibility of truly carbon neutral or carbon negative, um, and just to clarify, that's CO2 equivalent um, cheese um, for both dairy and alternatives. Um, and please include cheese making and storage processes as a part of the equation. Anybody want to take a stab at that? I can I can speak a little bit to it. I think Rich probably is the, the better expert, but what I am seeing so far from, from the industry is there is desire to improve um, on the environmental footprint, but I think the equation is incredibly complex because we need to look at the entire life cycle analysis. So not just putting solar panels on a cheese manufacturing plant or recycling water within the plant, but looking at the entire uh, chain from the birth of the cow, feeding of the cow in the water, et cetera. So a complete life cycle analysis, I think is critical for the industry to, to take an honest look at what the footprint is. The second piece to it, the complexity is that it's not just about CO2. It is about methane. It is about water waste pollution. It is about pesticide use in you know, corn and soy that gets fed to the said cows. It, it is about land use and deforestation. So it's a multi-pronged sustainability question and equation that needs to be solved. And at the moment, I think I'm seeing a lot of desire and kind of big picture goals, I think there are very few players, if any, that have truly solved it end to end across the board um, in, in the dairy space. That At least that's my perspective. And again, Rich, Rich is much closer to it than I am, but I think there's, there's a big hurdle in, in a true sustainability picture. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that if you look at the carbon neutral brands in the UK, there's a lot of self-certification going on. Um, personally, we've worked with the Carbon Trust in the UK, which is um, one of the high, most respected bodies. We're doing full cradle to grave footprinting. Um, it's a lot easier to achieve in your on our own scope one and two type emissions on the farm, obviously it is, it's more of a challenge where you know some of the record keeping maybe isn't quite as good, but the, the, the tools being developed in the UK for carbon footprinting on farm and you know we're, ev everyone in the UK is now reporting CO2 equivalent. So we're, we're, we're counting all the greenhouse gases, methane, nitrous oxides and everything else. So. Um, I think the, the, the methodology is robust in the UK now, and I think that there's a lot of progress being made, and the tools are certainly there. If you go on to most dairy farms in the UK now, we can identify most of the sort of key emission areas, and, um, you know, there's a huge amount of progress being made. Um, I think that 
there's still an awful lot of work to do and the farmers are learning all the time but I think one thing that focusing on um, the greenhouse gas emissions on farm and, and true carbon footprinting can do is make the farmers better environmentalists so they know they understand the impact of the decisions they're making and and they are reducing their emissions year on year which is which has to be progress we don't live in a perfect world but if we live in a world where we're trying to make it more perfect it's you know it's not going to be it's not going to be achieved in six months or a year but it's um, it's about making in incremental progress. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Rich. And Rena, thank you for your for your comments here as well. Um, unfortunately, given where we are from a timing perspective, um, we're going to have to hold off on additional questions at this time. But I do want to give our speakers uh, an opportunity. Um, well, first, uh, perhaps Rich and Kai, where can people find your products? Yes, yeah, so um, our products in the in the US, we're, we're dealing with Publix. And in Florida, we're doing... Um, quite a bit of Costco. So if you live in the Los Angeles region, I think our Ivy's Vintage is on promotion in the, um, in the Los Angeles region at the moment. Um, quite a lot of independent um, retailers as well. So, um, so um, yeah, well, we've just sort of started in the US. So hopefully, hopefully if I achieve nothing else today, I might sell a bit more cheddar. Thanks, Rick. <laughs> Hi. Awesome. So you can find my chocolate products through Happiest Plant Base across the country. We're in the NCG channel um, through Unify, Kahi. We're in North Atlantic Whole Foods, and we just launched our cheese in no, uh, Northern California Whole Foods. So we're in Northern Cal for the cheese product. You can get us online. Um, we are in a transition phase where we, we're building our our cheese caves out. So we're about three weeks away from shipping product, but um, we are in Northern California Whole Foods and we're all throughout Ohio, which is where we had our last cheese facility. Um, <clears throat> and then we're gonna be launching at um, in Kahi in the NCG channel by April of this year. So. You'll start to see it a little bit more, but in about three, four weeks, we'll be shipping online if anybody wants to go to eathappiest.com. Wonderful. Thanks, Kai. And then uh, Steve, Irina, any asks of the audience from, from yourselves? No, I, I just I would just say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pro all of plant-based cheese. We make for a number of the leading brands today, and so we don't disclose who our partners are. Um, we try to be food safe. We try to do all of the right things to support those purpose-driven brands. Um, you know, reach out to me personally through LinkedIn or through the Newfields or Whitehall website, and um, I'll try to do whatever I can to help support the cause. And uh, it's been a pleasure uh, being on this webinar with such a great, uh, great, great cast. Thanks, Steve. Arena. I, I nothing, nothing more, nothing specific for me, and no product in market yet. We're targeting, uh, you know, still probably a year or two out from from being able to enter the market. But certainly, if you follow me on LinkedIn, I'm fairly easy easy to reach there. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, uh, Rich, Kai, Arena, Steve, wonderful to have you all on today. Um, this was a really fascinating discussion. I really, really appreciate your time and your thoughtful perspectives here. Um, thank you to our audience as well for your active participation and for joining us today. Without you. Uh, our deep dives are not possible um, and we don't get to learn so much from interesting people um, like our speakers today. Um, and thank you for joining us in our continued journey uh, to understand food and health. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks everyone.